uh, I'll start with a personal note. Uh, I went, uh, I was uh, an MA, I'm an MA in English literature and I was teaching English literature. Now I happened to go to a place which was called at that time Central Institute of uh, English and Foreign Languages. Now it is a flu, it's in Hyderabad, where I did a, where I did an, you know, did a kind of uh, a diploma course in teaching of English. In the first semester, there were some three courses that I was doing related to language studies. In particular, there was a course on introduction to linguistics, a course on grammar, and a course on phonet phonology and phonetics. So, uh, so I was doing these courses and uh, I found, uh, I mean, I, let me share this with you. I found the entire subject of linguistics absolutely banal. You know, there was nothing of, uh, in phonology and phonetics, there was hardly anything that was of any interest to me. And grammar, uh, you know, sort of, I mean, there hardly, I, I didn't particularly care for grammar. And, uh, and during those days, there was a negative attitude towards uh, the you know, grammar and all that. You know? So grammar was considered to be something fit enough to be taught at school and not at higher levels. So I carried that uh, you know, prejudice with me. So at that time, you know, I thought, I'm not, I, it's okay, you know, I don't really, so I, I'm, I'm not bothered about this. When it came to linguistics, uh, we were uh, taught uh, things like uh, the difference between uh, human language and uh, animal systems of communication. It was a very traditional kind of topic uh, in the courses of, uh, in introductory courses during those days. And that is one topic I found extremely silly. I am not bothered about you know, how animals communicate. I am going to go and I will go and teach English to human beings and I am not bothered. Why waste my time? And uh, then questions like phonological structure, morphological structure, etc., etc. You know, I thought, okay, I mean, it, they, these may excite some people, but there was absolutely you know, nothing that heightened my or that you know, made me interested in these subjects. The course was ending and the last three or four classes were there. And my teacher, the, all the teachers are excellent, uh, but the subjects were uninteresting. And uh, the last few classes, the three top, three classes were devoted to a topic called transformational grammar. And I remember uh, in the first lecture, in his first lecture, the, the course instructor said that there is a person called Noam Chomsky and he says that all languages are identical at the level of some underlying representation, at the level of, you know, so they, they share common uh, structural features. Now, I am not exaggerating, I am telling you, I woke up. I thought, what kind of a thing is this? You know, I mean, we know that languages uh, are, I mean, no, no, sort of, I was in Hyderabad, so Telugu was unintelligible to me. The fact of language unintelligibility is, uh, you know, was nothing new. And we know that, that uh, two languages which are mutually unintelligible may not, it may not be the case that they have entirely different structures. That we knew. We had that much understanding of abstraction. Uh, we knew that uh, structurally, you know, they, I mean, let us say, you know, uh, Tamil and Odia, that's my language, you know. So, they are unintelligible, mutually unintelligible, but they share a structure. So, we knew that uh, that's fine. But then languages which have, which uh, do not, which cannot be linked in terms of history, genealogy, nothing, absolutely unrelated languages, okay. And then here is a person who is saying, that they have an identical structure at some level of, at some underlying level. I thought this is something which is marvelous. And he is saying such, he is saying something which sounds patently absurd. And so many people take him seriously. So, I think I was uh, in my early thirties then. Now, till uh, I retired from IIT Kanpur, those thirty years I devoted to finding out what is all this about. <laughs> okay. And I don't regret a moment of it. You know, it's so fascinating. Uh, I mean, see, it was. It, uh, we know that if you say languages are different, and languages have a different structure, each language has its own unique structure. 
you know, fine. I mean, th that doesn't disturb anybody because one would think that, okay, that's experience. You know, English has a subject, verb, object kind of structure. My language has subject, you know, object and verb kind of structure. So there are, in many ways, languages could differ like this at the level of structure. So that's not surprising. Okay, but what is surprising is the fact that uh, there is a kind of common sharing in terms of structures. So what is that? So I forgot my PhD research on E.M. Foster and thought that, okay, let me see what this is all about. I mean, it's almost like, you know, sort of uh, going on uh, a discovery trip, sort of finding out what all this is about. It's a kind of, you know, powerful intellectual experience. Many, many people would have joined, uh, you know, would have, would have tried to do linguistics for the same reason. How come, you know, sort of how does one account for the fact that languages share, that's the claim, uh, common features at some underlying level and yet, you know, they demonstrate different structural properties at other levels. Okay. So, so that's something which, that is, what is, uh, how does one articulate the underlying similarities between languages and their systematic differences. Languages do not differ from each other in structural terms in absolutely unpredictable, you know, ways. The ways languages differ from each other in structural terms are predictable, right? So we know that a language, the two languages can differ along certain lines. They cannot differ arbitrarily. Okay. It cannot be the case that there would be a language in which take a sentence of, you know, sort of take a sentence of a considerable length, right, and create a sentence which is the mirror image of that sentence and think that if the first sentence is grammatical, the mirror image of that sentence is also grammatical, nothing of this kind. You know, so there cannot be languages like this. So, so you know, sort of, so this kind, this is very fascinating that languages differ, surely, but they differ in predictable ways, in limited ways. So, you know, how, what kind of a theory is there to be able to account for all this? So, so that's where, you know, sort of, I, I think many, many people, you know, I mean, I was a small fry, but many, many people would have been interested in, in trying to find out what is this all about. So, that's one. And when Chomsky came into the scene, you know, the kind of grammar that was written uh, was what was called, you know, descriptive grammar, structural, you know, grammar. Uh, there was a um, there was a school of linguistic thought called uh, structural linguists. So they were very hardworking you know, people. They did a lot of uh, creative things in their own domain. But then, when, when, you know, they said that you see, linguistics is a science. They were the first people who said that linguistics is a science, and a classificatory science. You know, it's a classificatory science. So what did, what did it mean? It meant something like this that you, let us say, you know, talking about sentences. So let us say we, uh, we divide all sentences of the language into various, uh, you know, sub parts, uh, various groups. So call a particular kind of category, various categories, you know, call a category simple sentences, another category, you know, simple negatives, another category, you know, sort of simple questions, then uh, compound questions, you know, so, so, so categorize sentences and label each category. So simple sentences, compound sentences, complex sentences. Within simple, negatives, questions, you know, imperatives, whatever. So you, you know, so you, you collect data very carefully using the most sophisticated instruments of data collection and arrives at sentence level. You do a lot more, you know, you, you start from the phonological level and then you come to the sentence level. And then when you come to the sentence level, what you do is, you, you, you categorize your sentences in terms of subcategories like simple, compound, complex, just as I told you. Okay. Now, see, uh, categorizing, uh, categorization is not a simple task. It's a, it's a fairly challenging intellectual task because you are, you are looking at the features and carefully trying to say which are the distinctive or distinguishing features of each category. So it's not a small thing. We should not really, you know, think that it's unimportant. But when I was teaching at IIT Kanpur, I used to say that this is like what happens in Bata Dukan. 
you go to a Bata shoe shop and you have panch number shoes, sat number shoes, art number shoes in different cat, you know, in different you know sort of slots. Okay. Now, of what great interest is this? You know, I, I mean, we trivialized it, but now I don't want to trivialize. You know, the categorization is a serious task. You know, I mean, you find out features, common features, you, you know, distinguishing features. So it's it's not unimportant. But you see, when it comes at the end of it, what have you done? At the end of it, you simply have you know sort of slotted them into different uh, categories, and that's about it. Now, Chomsky said, no, this cannot be a very interesting and serious science. You know, it can't be interesting. I and mean, what? I and mean, science is not concerned about classification. Although much later I came to learn that today's, you know, today biology is a very sophisticated subject, but only 50 years ago biology was a classificatory science. I mean, about 50 years ago, okay. It was more or less a classificatory science, okay. So maybe disciplines have to undergo a stage of classification. You know, maybe, I mean, uh, questions of uh, explanatory nature. Maybe it's difficult uh, that such questions are asked at a certain level of an intellectual enterprise. So maybe a kind of, you know, uh, a kind of stage has to be gone through where classification becomes extremely important. But then uh, Chomsky said, no, we need explanatory theories. Okay. Huh? So, so wh what kind of explanatory theories do we need? What do we explain? Okay. So, you know, for the first time, I mean, he not only, he, he said, what kind of a science linguistics would be? What kind of a science is this? You know, at that time, today it's slightly different, but at that time, uh, there are no experiments. You know, you couldn't conduct experiments, okay, right? You know, you, you come up with, uh, you, you postulate linguistic rules, but there are no experimental, there, there, there are no experimental evidence for the same, right? So some people, you know, who wrongly associate science with explanation, sorry, associate science with experimentation, you know, I mean, mature sciences like physics and all, we know that, I mean, sort of, you know, the, 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 how important experimentation is there uh, for those sciences. So because of the success of the natural sciences, so sometimes, you know, people tend to associate experimentation with scientific inquiry. So if your science or what you are claiming to be science has no experiments, right, you know, your science cannot be taken seriously. It is at best a kind of, you know, folklore, uh, uh, it is at best a kind of, you know, uh, pre-scientific science or whatever, if you call it a science, okay, right. So don't make any scientific claims for that, you know. So you don't have an experiment. So how does one get support, I mean, for the postulations that you are making? Okay, huh? so that was there. But then that's not a very serious, I mean, I, you know, see for example in astronomy, okay, what kind of experiment should you have in astronomy? And is astronomy art? I wish it were, but you know, is it art? You know, it's not. So it is not the case that in all sciences, you know, you would like to have experimentation. Now, if you don't have experimentation in your, uh, you know, in, I mean, in, in your domain of inquiry, which you want to call science, okay. How, how does one evaluate the findings, right? How does one evaluate the findings? You know, whatever findings you have arrived at, how does one check? Now, if there is no way to check whether your findings are correct or incorrect or whatever, right? Then we are not doing any, you know, we are not into any rational enterprise. We are into some kind of mystic enterprise, okay? You say something and by definition or, or definitionally that's true. You know, it's almost a claim, making a claim like that. So what, so, 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 you know, so, so what does it do? So all right, so you write a grammar of English. Let's imagine you write a grammar of English, okay. Huh? Now, so what do you do? How do you test it? Okay. Huh? The simplest thing is so long as you are writing a grammar of English, you test it against the data. So does it account for all data? Okay. Does it, you know, account for in this case would mean does it cover all data, right? So if it covers all data, you, you think that, okay, maybe, you know, there is, I mean, it, it's, it's right, okay. But soon you know that, I mean, you are not, you know, an enterprise uh, cannot stop with writing the grammar of or working out the grammar of a single language because English is a language, so is Hindi, so is Odia, so is Swahili, so are many other languages, right. They are all objects of the same type, you know, they are all objects of the same type. Right? So, 
so a kind of descriptive mechanism or a descriptive device that you have arrived at for one language right should apply in you know to other languages as well because there is no science where for each object of inquiry there is a there is a kind of theory so and it's not like the it's not like the it's not it's, it cannot be the case that for hindi there will be theory of grammar for english there will be theory of grammar and these theories of grammar will have no you know there will no way to converse i mean no conversation would be possible between these theories of grammar that's a false thing it was noted way back in 57 it was noted that uh, all grammars of languages you know who, i mean people wrote grammars of various languages now you know you had notions like subject you had notions like object you had notions like noun verb pronoun like that verb you know right so is it accidental that when somebody writes a grammar of english he uses these terms you write a grammar of sanskrit you also use these terms you know right so is it accidental that languages when you write grammars of different languages you know the grammatical vocabulary is something which is largely similar how does it happen okay huh? so the question that arises is where do you get your basic terms from okay right where do you get the terms from so these have to come from some kind of a theory there has to be a theory of grammar and from that the, that theory of grammar would itself specify that these are the kinds of notions that we, we are going to have and these are the kind of interactions that we are going to have between you know whatever entities so what are the entities how do the entities and you know sort of interact so these are things which cannot be just for one language they have to be for all languages okay it's not an accident that you know you have uh, i mean as i said you know sort of it's not an accident that subject object verb you know noun pronoun etc categories and category labels whenever you write a grammar for any language these are the categories which you use how come okay huh? so if you have to find an explanation for this you cannot find an explanation from history of writing of grammars no you can't say oh let's write a history of grammars of all languages you know and you know, somewhere you and you won't, you won't get it anywhere you have to have something like a linguistic theory a grammatical theory and the theory will give us the terminology the basic concepts the interactions everything right so for the first time in the history of uh, linguistics in the linguistics there was felt the need for a theory of language or theory of grammar see linguistics is not you know i mean linguistics was not always called linguistics it was called grammar or whatever else okay but linguistics is a civilizational subject you know it is not something which is recent 2500 years ago in greek civilization you know sort of uh, linguistics was being done and even earlier in india people were doing linguistics we talk about panini who is probably 2500 years old years old but panini is only the finest flowering of a tradition that existed panini you know it's not that grammatical tradition started with panini no lots of people had worked before panini worked so this rich traditions you know so grammatical studies are that old okay but for the first time in the history of grammatical studies you know the need for a general lingu- the general grammatical theory general linguistic theory was felt i am not saying that people who wrote grammars before did not have a theory of grammar they had a theory of grammar but what that theory of grammar was never expl- it was never explicated because it was not necessary to spell out the kind of grammar that they had okay kind of theory of grammar that they had in other words you know what is the theory of grammar what are the goals of study of grammar right what does it explain something does it categorize something what does it do okay what are the upper boundaries and lower boundaries you know the usual question that you ask about theories right right so you know and what is the architecture you know they they had some notion surely if you don't have these theoretical notions you cannot write a grammar right you know the the person who wrote a grammar of you know sanskrit uh, uh, phonology morphology etc etc or karaka had an idea of what a gra- what a grammatical system is like what a language is like what kind of structural you know system the language is, is likely to have that is why he he divided them into phonology morphology whatever he had but then there was no articulation of it there is no explicit articulation of it so the need for an explicit articulation of the theory of grammar was felt 
so strongly and you know was realized and you know it i mean this is the, i mean when chomsky came into the scene so we must remember chomsky as a man right you know who for the first time articulated the 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 need for an explicit linguistic or grammatical theory okay huh? and then you know the the other th so so you know so you have a theory and all these will follow the grammatical terminology will follow and terminology is just you know i mean one part of it because you are talking about what what is the what are terms the terms are term are labels of entities and next is interaction between entities and you know they they interact within a framework and that's the architecture so so all these things would come okay at a, at, at later stage right I mean, all these things would come okay and then you write your grammar in terms of that right now suppose you have postulated something right in your model and you are saying that you know this is something which is a general feature of all languages imagine something like you know what i'm going to say okay imagine something like uh, you have done uh, phrase structure rules right you are familiar with phrase structure rules okay imagine that what that that phrase structure rules are part of universal grammar a term with which you are familiar right let us imagine that phrase structure rules are a part of universal grammar now how do you know the coming back to the question as to if we don't have experiments right how do we test you know our findings our hypothesis okay right so how do we test so we test is like this if you can arrive at a grammar where you can dispense with phrase structure rules completely right you know that you would say that that is something you know that's a that a, that that's a test so when you you know you you can postulate a theory of grammatical universals right but then this theory of grammatical universals whether you know a particular rule or a particular mechanism or a particular you know whatever right kind of rule etc huh? so if i mean this rule has to has to stand the test of scrutiny you know from other languages right so you write a grammar of another let's say there is a, you know let's say you are postulating uh, some some rule on the basis of uh, english let us say you know, that you can do you can say that uh, we have phrase structure rules in english grammar and we our hypothesis is that phrase structure rules do not simply belong to the grammar of english phrase structure rules belong to you know they are a part of universal grammar now if somebody works you know on i mean if somebody uh, is working on some other language and is able to argue that you don't have a need for the phrase structure rules that you have postulated and you are claiming universality or you know, universal status for them right then the phrase structure rules are you know, sort of i mean they are question they cannot be so the test so, so the, the testing device comes from careful analysis of another language uh, of the grammatical you know features of another language, grammatical systems of another language okay huh? so please notice one thing you know you can't you, i mean data cannot falsify a theoretical claim right suppose you know you are making a theoretical claim about uh, whether phrase to, uh, about the fact that phrase structure rules exist as part of universal grammar right they are a part of universal grammar okay so let's imagine that this is a theoretical claim that you are making at the moment it is an it is an assumption you have posited it on the basis of study of a single language a careful study of a single language okay right the testing comes not from the fact that there are sentences in other languages right which you know seem to falsify the claim so data cannot falsify the the theoretical claim right data cannot direct unanalyzed raw data cannot falsify a theoretical claim okay what can is analyze data into a system of rules a rule you know i mean if, if, if there is a rule that exists or you are claiming a rule to be universal a counter example will be from you know from the gram from another grammar in terms of another rule rules you know that kind of thing you cannot uh, you you cannot falsify you know I mean, direct uh, unanalyzed data cannot be used to falsify you know or uh, question uh, or undervalue uh, you know theoretical postulations in this particular case as something like a theory of rule okay so you know you know what move alpha okay right you know what move alpha okay if you find an example from another language which says that we really don't need something like move alpha okay we can do whatever we what whatever move alpha does we can do by using some other device and we can do something more and if you know so so look at the level of claim the claim is being made at the level of a rule 
not at the level of you know i mean direct raw data okay right so so, so what chomsky did was you know it's interesting what he did was he not only created a sort of field in the sense he raised new questions with respect to grammar he also provided a way of how to test them because experimental testing at that time was not there okay huh? okay huh? now you know today there are experiments you know people do conduct experiments right but you know i'm not going to get into that and there are all kinds of questions that can be raised with respect to those experiments as um, if you want to use them to falsify theories you know there are complications there you know they are not straightforward so let's not go into that okay huh? so all that i'm i'm so far what i have tried to suggest is this that linguistics was considered to be a classificatory science when chomsky came into the scene chomsky said classificatory science is okay but not sufficient a, a discipline has to be ex, you know it has to be explanatory in nature so you have to come up with explanations now what kind of explanation what is it that you are explaining okay the data the data are what you are explaining you know right and uh, and and, and uh, what is what is explanation you come up with more and more I mean, you know simpler more elegant grammars so the grammar itself is a kind of explanation you know for the kind for the data so you know it's explained by by grammar okay and the falsification of this or testing of this would come from grammars of other languages right okay so something like that you know so roughly uh, sort of so this is what it is and many many interesting questions started getting raised say for example you know consider something like subject object and verb right you know take them as three different categories so how many combinations are possible eight combinations i think no you can permute them and combine them in eight ways right so you know so what would we expect we would expect that we will encounter languages in the world right which will have which will which will demonstrate each one of these categories right so there will be you no know, languages which will demonstrate each of these categories but the fact is that it's not really like this you know most of the languages are sov uh, hindi type sov languages you know i'm quite a large number of languages are english type you know svo some are vso okay and maybe there are certain other types okay and i'm forgetting details but there are certain categories who do not show up at all okay so so that's the kind of thing so you see if you have a certain kind of you know i mean if you have this vso right uh, you know i'm sorry if if you take this terms you know subject verb and object right okay and think in term and and you know sort of uh, think of languages right so you will expect something like eight categories and you will expect uh, the world to demonstrate this category but that doesn't happen so what we are dealing with here is not a question of logic but something else logically you would expect all these uh, you know sort of categories of languages to 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 be there in the world but they are not there so what we are dealing with is not really a question of logic but something else okay now why is it that most of the languages are of you know of sov and svo types and there are languages language types which are not simply there why is why is the world like this so there is a variety you know linguistic world you know there is a variety it's not you know it's not uniform in the sense that there is not, not just one type of language sov no there is a variety okay but the variety is a constrained kind you know it is not that whatever is you know sort of whatever pos what the all the logical possibilities are realized in in actual uh, in, in in you know in actual uh, reality of lang uh, languages it's not like that okay huh so so this is a question to ask why is it like this now look at the kind of question that is being asked okay right these were never these were never the kind of questions were asked before chomsky came into the scene you know right in the, in the, in the 60s and all these questions uh, or early 70s these questions were getting asked and these questions in all those thousands of years of our you know rich linguistic uh, you know history no one ever asked these questions you know the reasons are of course simple i mean you you always looked at one language so you wrote the most economical grammar of one language right you never thought that okay you know here is another language here is another language you know right okay so what i am saying for this language and if i find that there are similarities you know i find in other languages which i am exposed to in day to day life okay it never you know it never attracted the attention of any one of them to find out is this similarity accidental okay 
it is not that you know sort of in our i mean panini or our great sanskrit uh, grammarians uh, did not know any other language or were not exposed to any other language so they were you know but you see there are certain there are certain attitudes because of his he never cared to study them you know if you look up uh, i mean uh, the tradition i am in a sort of um, bimal matilal says that uh, our sanskrit scholars you know grammarians would study the language of somebody of of a category of people whom he called shistas shista 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 is one who is not just a scholar but also a man with you know spiritual uh, attainments see <laughs> so if you say that we are going to study the language of a, a set of people okay and this and this will be kind of you know elite okay and we will not bother about the study of any other uh, you know sort of groups of people right what would you do this is one of the consequences that even though you find that you know the people whom you have defeated in the defeated in some war and taken them as slaves to your households okay they speak a different language you will not treat that their language seriously consider the language seriously because you don't treat them seriously and you have decided that you would study the language of only you know i mean in, in some sense you know the purest kind of language okay all these terms make no sense in a democratic world okay right but you know if you decide to study that that's true everywhere in the western tradition you know look at the grammar books the best of uh, writings of the best of authors were what uh, were the data for uh, grammatical analysis spoken language hardly analyzed it was debased corrupt you know anyway sort of so so you see because i think uh you see it's very difficult to find a social i mean to 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 you see if you're writing you looking at the history of knowledge it is very difficult to explain uh, certain things in that history in terms of sociological facts you know i'm not saying that this would explain that but perhaps you know if we did not you see the, all these things you know, i mean if if we did not uh, in our civilization uh, uh, consider the fact that if if sanskrit has a structure like this you know some other language has also similar structures even when you notice you know you didn't raise any question out of it you know right and that's because uh, we were uh, possibly you know sort of we didn't think that uh, languages of others was considered to be a serious uh, subject of investigation and sister so long as the sister attitude is there we will study the language of the sister the loan and sister you know is defined not as somebody who is a scholar but also as somebody who has spiritual attainments you know who is studying for for the sake of the study for for, for you know who is studying for you know for uh, not for any benefit but for general good you know things of this kind so if you do that you are your data domain is is shrunk okay so other similarities and dissimilarities you know you just ignore right it is only when you discover it is only when you note the similarities and dissimilarities that your mind gets challenged to find out how come you know there are how come these, there is a similarity and how come there are dissimilarities so you will try and explain this in terms of you know i mean in, in in some term okay one is you know postulate something called a universal grammar and postulate parameters you know which will define you know the the systematic differences between grammars okay ha huh? so you know only when you only when you notice this and only only when you think that this is something that is worthy enough uh, for investigation okay ha huh? the languages the uh, some features are similar some features are dissimilar how does one explain dissimilarity and similarity right how does one explain dissimilarity and similarity right so you, you, you can do it in many ways you know? i mean you can do it Let, let's try and uh, see what we can do with with uh, with this simple observation that you know the, let's say given two languages or three languages we find certain similarities between them at the structural level right and we find certain dissimilarities how do we go about it so suppose we say you know the fundamental principle all lang um, languages differ right structurally right you know suppose you say all languages differ structurally right period you can't raise the question about sim similarity you know if languages differ from each other in uh, you know and um, if that is the story right okay that is what your observation is that languages differ from each other right so suppose you say we have a theory and we look at the grammars like this all languages are you know each language is unique and is describable in its own terms you know so suppose you have this kind of a theory okay right the question of accounting for similarities cannot even be raised right 
Now, suppose you have, a, you have an alternative theory and says all languages, you know, I mean, there is a lot of, see, you finding similarities, you say all languages are similar. And, you know, suppose you say this, you know it is false. It just cannot be, right? So then, but if you take that kind of a view, you at least have a possibility of trying to find out, okay, given the similarities, how do I account for the differences? Okay, and when you discover the differences are not, you know, un, I mean, sort of wild and unpredictable, right? You know, arbitrary, then you will have a way of trying to find out how to, you know, sort of account for this uh, similarity and dissimilarity, right? Okay, huh? so, so that's the universal grammar and that's parameters, okay, right? Parameters who are, you know, sort of in, 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 in one model, they are called, the, sort of, the, the, the term parameter is used for them in one model. Earlier the term was not used, something else was used. But essentially the fact is, that how do we account for the similarities between, you know, grammars of different languages and their systematic dissimilarities? So, so you are working out in various models at various times in many ways. Okay, huh? So, 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 you know, so this is something, okay. Now let us go to something else. See, in all cultures, you know, another uh, two, 2 o'clock, no? Yes. Yeah, in, 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 uh, uh, in our culture, and I am sure in other cultures as well, at least in our culture, see, look at you, you had people like, you know, we had a rich grammatical tradition, you know, Panini and all, right? Uh, so you ask them this question, okay, how is, uh, what is the, you know, what, I mean, uh, what is the grammar of Sanskrit, right? One, one extremely good answer is Panini's grammar. An economical, detailed, economical, sophisticated, formal, generative grammar. Panini is the first generative linguist and not Chomsky, because you look at Panini's phonological rules, they, they are generative rules, okay. So in any case, you know, that's another topic. In any case, you know, so, so, I mean, a very sophisticated grammar, right? So what is the structure of Sanskrit? Panini's grammar is the answer. Huh? What is the structure of Sanskrit? Panini's grammar is the answer. How is Sanskrit learned? Or how is, you know, how is Sanskrit learned? In Astadhyay, you will have no insights about how this is all learned. Okay, right? So those who really worked out the structures did not address themselves to the, themselves to the question of how these structures are acquired by people or learned by people. No. Right? Similarly, you know, at a later stage, uh, there are uh, thinkers in our culture who raise this question, how do children learn a language? Okay. So, and they came up with answers, you know, like, uh, see, uh, through observation, you know, so, I mean, they, they find that uh, somebody is telling somebody, bring the horse. So, actually, somebody goes and brings the horse, you know, okay, right? And somebody says, pass the salt. So, you know, so, I mean, you, they, they listen to the sentences through observation, they make inferences and all that. So, you know, they learn from experience, they learn from explicit teaching, they learn from the grammar books, they learn from, you know, lexicon, the, the, the dictionary. So, many ways, you know, right? Okay. Now, what they said would resemble very much what our behaviorists said about learning. You know, the, the behaviorists, you know, positivists, you know, what they said about how things are learned. Essentially, things are learned from experience. Okay, huh? So, nothing like, you know, mind is a clean slate. You know, I mean, I'm oversimplifying everything really. Okay. So, the mind is a clean slate. So, there's nothing in it. So, from experience, we keep on, you know, sort of, we abstract from experience and keep on adding knowledge. Right? So, that is how it is, it is learned. So, 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 somebody says, you know, bring the horse or sort of um, whatever. Okay. Right? Bring the horse or bring the food. And you find that this is happening. So, from this, the child infers... Uh, you know, the, the, the grammar and it is supplemented by classroom teaching, grammar books, blah, 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 you know, all these kinds of things, okay. So, essentially, this is a kind of behaviorist account. Essentially, it is a behaviorist account of, uh, you know, language learning, okay, right. And these people who were concerned with the question of how a language is learned, okay, did not ask themselves the question, what is the structure of a language? So, my, the point that I am trying to make is that you see, what is the structure of language was a question which was independent of the question, how is that language is learned or how are those structures learned. So, the structure of a language and the learning of a language were two distinct questions, okay, huh? and they were answered in, in different ways, right. Now, what Chomsky did was, in some sense, he combined these. And that's a great achievement. Okay. Huh? So, you know, he said, 
you know, questions like this, okay. How do you compare, you know, in the beginning, right? When he came up with this, you know, generative grammar, transformational generative grammar, and there are the structural grammars before that. You know, structural grammars, traditional grammars, before that all those grammars existed. So, the, so the natural the question will arise, how do you compare these grammars? Okay. Huh? So you can say, no, you know, sort of, uh, I mean, uh, generative grammars try to show sentence relationships. You know, that what's the relation between active and passive? What's the relation between, you know, an imperative and uh, a non-imperative? You know, like, what is the relation between sentences, right? So you apply a passive transformation or whatever and you get a passive sentence. Imagine, you know, that, let's imagine this, okay. So you have an acti active structure, apply a passive transformation, so you get a passive sentence, huh? Okay. Just one thing, you know, so transformations are not applied to sentences. They are applied to structures, okay. In any case, so, so you know, you are trying to find relationships, right? Okay. Uh, that is coming is a fact. It is a fact that is coming. So you relate these sentences, okay, huh? Right? So let's say generative grammar was trying to find sentence relationships and account for sentence relationships. What, what does that mean explain or account for? In terms of the grammatical system. The system would say that, okay, you know, we can generate these sentences and all that, in, right? Okay. Now structural linguists you know, would say, no, we never tried this. You know, we didn't try this. So why are you comparing us with generative linguists and say that we are inferior in some sense? Okay. Because, you know, we never tried this. You have changed the goalposts. So, right? Okay. So you, you can't change the goalpost and score goals over us, you know. Because we never, you know, what we do, we never did. Then how do you compare grammars then? Now the answer that was given at that time was, you know, that grammar is the best or that grammar is the most appropriate, the most suitable grammar, which explains language acquisition facts better. Right? So look at the connection now. Huh? So you know, sort of your, your, there is a structural grammar and there is a generative grammar. Generative grammar is trying to account for sentence differences, which, oh, sorry, sentence you know, relatedness, which structural linguistics did not try to do. So the question is, these are incommensurable. The goals are incommensurable. We are trying to do X, they are trying to do Y, and you can't compare you know, these two models to these two models of grammar, because you know, their, their objectives are different. How can you do that? Okay. Then the answer to this is, yeah, you still can compare them on a different parameter, and that parameter has nothing to do with the grammar. That parameter has to, to do with, you know, how, I mean, which explains language acquisition facts better, right? Look at the assumptions you are making now. The assumption, <coughs> the assumptions you are making is, <coughs> I mean, if 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 an if 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 if, uh, if, a, if an architecture of structure, right, can be evaluated in terms of how it is acquired, right? You know, I mean, what are you doing? You are saying. That you see, we are acquiring that architecture because the mind is ready in some sense, the mind is you know, predisposed in some sense to learn that architecture or to acquire that architecture. Okay, huh? Right? You know, if you are able to learn a system, right? You, you know, right? You learn that system because you already have some means in your mind, some equipment in your mind in terms of which you learn that system. Okay, huh? So now the system, and look at the relatedness between the system and cognizing that system, or you know, or acquiring that system. You acquire the system, right? Because there is some system in your mind, which really, you know, in terms of which you acquire that system more easily than, than some other system, right? Okay, huh? That is what you know. That that's makes you feel that okay, maybe you know, there is a genetic endowment. We are born with a certain capacity, right? We are, we are born with a certain kind of, you know, I mean, sort of uh, gift, nature, nature's gift, in terms of which we make sense out of our linguistic experience. What does that mean to make sense of linguistic experience? You know, we are able to construct a grammar from the data that we are exposed to, right, as children, right? You know, we are able to do that because there is already something in our mind, right, in terms of which we do this. Okay, huh? Okay. You know, otherwise we can't, right? You cannot make, you can make sense out of experience only in terms of an intellectual, you know, only in terms of knowledge. Without knowledge, you know, <laughs> there is no way you can understand experience, right? This is a very, very important thing that, you know, that we have to keep in mind. Okay, huh? Okay. So, you know, so, 
so so i mean so how do i get that uh, where do i get it from it cannot be taught okay you can't teach a one year old child you know right a grammar right you know what kind of instruction do they get they get some simple instruction about you know, this is the object this is called this this is called that you know, this is the mother this father you know etc etc okay very simple but then no sophisticated information and yet a whole grammar you know a system is learned so that it simply means that by you know we are somehow by nature we are gifted with some kind of a knowledge right in terms of which we understand that uh, we, we make sense of experience and acquire that knowledge okay call that knowledge now you know so so i mean only saying this is not sufficient okay so what is that knowledge how do i describe it now call that knowledge universal grammar so what am i born with i am born with universal grammar right now another name for universal grammar is the initial state of knowledge of language okay the initial state of knowledge of language right what is, and how do i describe initial state of uh, knowledge of language by in, in by working out the architecture of universal grammar now you you see the connections now right you know which grammar is the best out of a number of possible grammars that grammar which explains language acquisition facts better right now what does it i mean what does it really mean that you see in order to acquire language in order to acquire a language or the structure of a language we already have to have, you know so we we have we have to have a structure in terms of which makes sense of other structures explicitly available to us okay huh? so now look at the connection and i think it's a supreme creative uh, it's you know it's a, it's it's a it's a demonstration of the supremely creative mind of chomsky which connected these questions e both of these are civilizational questions how do we learn a language okay look no civilization asks this question how do we learn geometry okay you know but it is asked you know i mean obviously the, the reason is very you know i mean not a uh, we know why because you know geometry is always uh, you know learned at a later level okay but language is learned you know at I mean, by one year one year olds you know demonstrate their uh, understand the, their, their command of language okay that doesn't happen in case of mathematics right so obviously you, know, you don't ask a question like you know how do you learn artha shastra right okay you learn it you know through explicit instruction but in language case it is different right so anyway so this question as to how a language is learned has been asked you know i mean by people in various cultures thousands of years ago how do i describe the structure of a language is also a question which had been asked even probably before you know these acquisition questions were asked okay huh? they were different questions in panini astadhyay you will have absolutely no account of how this is learned in kumarila bhatta and other you know philosophers uh, uh, speculations who raise this question of how a language is learned you will find absolutely nothing about the phonological structure or the morphological structure of a language okay they are different questions now see these different questions are you know sort of seen as one by chomsky okay huh? so universal grammar can also be described as the initial state of knowledge of language okay huh? and we think that initial state of knowledge of language you know is what we are born with okay and i'll conclude because I, I, there is a lot to say but i'll conclude by making only one point see why is this enterprise so exciting this enterprise is so exciting you know because hundreds and hundreds of unresolved questions okay huh? so you, you all the time feel that you know what we know is probably not right okay right maybe you know there is there you know i mean see we have some confidence okay but we are never sure that we have really we are even approaching uh, we are even, you know going the right way we don't even know one simple uh, you know problem is this see you know that i can i mean one can analyze the structure of a, of a sentence without knowing the meaning of that sentence colorless green ideas live furiously you know you can you can assign a structure to this without you know bothering about its meaning okay so you know i mean npvp whatever you know right you can you can work out the internal structure i have tested the following you know but i but you know i mean my testing may be wrong but you know i have i have done the following i have you know take it to the level of discourse a discourse comprises several sentences right you know 10 sentences let us say you know so i gave a paragraph i mean i gave some three you know i mean you know, page to my students okay and it was on the football or pele 
Okay, you know, a beautiful write-up by Edward Agariano. So I just removed the paragraph for divisions and all that and gave the text to my students. One would think that, you know, if you are talking about the structure of a written text, one would think that uh, chunks, you know, you will you'll divide them into chunks and in some sense a chunk would correspond to a paragraph in print. Okay. Suppose, you know, you do that. So that is an assumption which I had. What is the structure of, a, of the discourse, you know, right? So we can think, okay, you know, we can divide them into chunks, which is what the computational linguists, some of them who are working on discourse do. And then, you know, I mean, so let's say we do this, okay. Now, we give it to students, right? See, you would find, you know, this is what I found, you would also find that people divide them into paragraphs depending on the meanings. Because if they do not know the meanings, they simply would not be able to arrive at any decision with respect to which, which you know, become a chunk and which not. How does it, and how is it? If it is correct that the structure of a sentence can be analyzed or can be arrived at without reference to meaning at all, you know, that's absolutely clearly demonstrated, right? You know, okay. And, uh, you know, whereas in course of discourse, which is actually some total of sentences, this simply does not seem to work, then what is happening? You know, can we have one theory for sentences, another theory for discourse, which itself is, you know, comprises several sentences? No, I do not know what is happening, you know. So, you see, there will be, there are hundred and there are mo much more technical internal questions, right, which we have and we do not know the answers to those questions, right. We are working on them, you know, we do not know the answers. So, an enterprise is alive and kicking if there are unresolved problems, okay, huh? right? So that is why, you know, I mean, this, pro this program of doing generative linguistics is exciting. I will end by making this one, only one observation about the contribution of Chomsky. See, there are many people who have at many times said that Chomsky is, you know, has misled linguistic community by, you know, his theories, okay, right? But he has done something, you know, and I, I, would, I would even say that maybe all that we know today principles and the parameters, theory, you know, whatever, all that we know today may turn out to be absolutely blatantly wrong, possible. You know, maybe more interesting, more formal grammars would, would arise and, you know, would, would, I mean, they, would, they would emerge and say that all this is wrong. But there is one thing that, you know, cannot be proved to be wrong. Chomsky has set the agenda of how to do linguistics, okay, right? These, these formal mechanisms may be substituted. But nobody can say that you will have one theory for Sanskrit, one theory for, you know, one grammatical theory for Sanskrit and one grammatical theory for, you know, Hindi. You can't do that. You have to, you know, tackle the question of universals. You, you cannot go back to an earlier stage and say each language has its own structure. No, that is gone. So you have to tackle the question of universals. You cannot anymore say that when we talk about the structure of languages, we will not raise these fundamental questions regarding acquisition. No. You know, so whatever theories you come up with, okay, whatever, you know, new balances you come up with where, you know, what is a gi biologically given and what is learned from experience, the same thing, nurture and nature and nurture, what is given, what is learned through experience. So there may be many ways of, you know, fine tuning bit, uh, between the relations, relations between these, but the fact remains that there cannot be a day, there will not be a day when you would say that, okay, we need separate grammatical theories for, this, for, for, separate, for, for different grammatical theories for different languages. We will not ask acquisition questions when we raise questions of structure. These are not the things, you know, that, I mean, we cannot go back to those days of innocence. And that is, you know, I mean, here is a man who has told us how to do linguistics. So the technical uh, solutions may all turn out to be wrong, but there is no going back to universal grammar. Okay. There may be different articulation of the grammar. The architecture that we may come up with may not be the same, but you know, there is no question of saying that no, it's wrong. I mean, that we don't want to do it anymore. Well, I think I'll stop here. Thank you.